So hello everybody, am I talking too loudly and I've got this microphone on? Is that all right? Oh, okay, thank you. Um, just before I start, I just want to think, I want you to acknowledge this fly that has been flying. Have you noticed? All day. He's brilliant. And then earlier he had a mate as well, so there were two of them flying. And it reminded me a bit of that, remember the Atari tennis, tennis that we used in the old days? So he might, he might fly around on my, on my screen and we should, there he is, and he's very welcome. So, hello, so I'm just going to come and talk to you for about 15 minutes at the most about um, the project that I'm involved in called the Birmingham Craftivists. Um, and the thing I suppose I would say to you first before I start is that I'm not, it's not about um, selling the idea to you. It's really about an idea that myself and a few mates have got together to, to, um, to create pieces of work that have a bit of a kind of political meaning. So I'm not, I'm not here to recruit people into the movement of craftivism, and I'm not here to be evangelical. I suppose I'm just here to kind of share our ideas, really. Um, and we try to spread a bit of kindness, um, with the help of my little fly friend. We, sp and we try to spread kindness with our creativity and our ideas, and that's kind of it in a nutshell, really. Um, Birmingham Craftivists, we set up in about, oh, about eight months ago, um, and there's no, there's no kind of um, foundation to it. All there is behind craftivism is me, a Facebook page, some like-minded women and men, like-minded people getting together. There's no funding behind us. We're not, we're not a, um, a fledgling social enterprise or any of those things. We actually don't intend to be. We just want to be a group of people that come together to share some ideas, bring our creative skills and our political mindedness together um, and just work together, really. Rifat is here as well from, from the group, and Rifat's been a mate of mine for many, many years. We are part of a national um, organisation called the Craftivist Collective. So if anybody would like to find out any more about what craftivism means as a whole, both nationally and internationally, just Google the Craftivist Collective and you'll get taken to the website. And there's loads of fantastic ideas, um, resources, information, um, national and international campaigns that people can get involved with. And I, I was drawn to craftivism um, mainly because I, my, I, um, my background very briefly is I did an art degree about 25 years ago. I worked in art therapy for a long, long time and then moved into social work. Um, and now I, I lecture in social work, but I have kept my creativity going for as, as much as I can do, you know, at the same time as having a family and, and you know, kind of living my life. And I struggled for quite a long time to bring my creativity into my, into my life. Um, and for a long time, it kind of was dormant. And a lot, I think a lot of people that are creatives who have other things in their lives, they tend to kind of put that away. And, and it, it almost becomes something that we used to do, or, oh yeah, I used to draw, or oh, I used to do. And I, I hated the thought that that was going to be something that I used to do. So craftivism, um, I kind of stumbled across it really, mainly through my political activism, and I found it a fantastic way of bringing my own kind of um, personal values and ethics and beliefs together with my creative skills, and then bringing mates together again who have got those, uh, share those two passions as well. And craftivism, I should say, is nothing new. It's, nothing fa it's just a fancy word. If you look at craft, and then imagine that hyphen with activism, all it is is the merging of those two words, craft, craft and activism. And there are craftivist groups across the world, and craftivist groups in, in Birmingham and, and in, um, in, in England and Scotland as well, and Wales. They're all over the place, really. So it's not a new concept. That idea of using art, creativity, and political activism is as old as people are, so you know it's not a new. It's a new. It's one of those kind of trendy, funky new words, isn't it, that people kind of create. That actually, a new word wasn't actually necessary, but it sounds quite good. So there you go. That's a craftivist. Um, so my trusty suitcase comes with me, and that, that's this is literally our resources. Our resources fit into my suitcase. So we've, as I say, we've got no money behind us other than what fit, whatever can fit in the suitcase is part of the craftivist movement. And we, um, we share materials, we donate stuff to each other, don't we? we um, Rifat is a great uh, womble, so anything she finds that's been discarded, she brings along to the group and we make use of it. So we've got no masses of, um, of, of resources behind us. One of the things we don't do that might be slightly different to other arts projects and things that, um, that people are involved with and have talked about today is that we don't make work to sell. We're not interested, for our, for our own organisation's point of view, our project's point of view, we're not interested in making work that, that makes money. There's enough stuff out there that gets involved in the capitalist exchange and we're not interested in that. Um, we produce work that actually 
we don't we try very hard to produce work that we're not wedded to we, we don't feel that it's precious to us and i'll explain a bit about that as i go along so we make work that we don't sell and we don't feel we have ownership of and that's a bit uh, marxist for anybody that's interested in that um so i think that this kind of this um uh quote kind of sums us up really which uh, um, we've used a few times in some of in some of our projects we are a group of people that have come together through years and years of political activism and campaigning. So lots of us, and I'm sure there's people here that have been on hundreds of marches, signed hundreds of petitions, got angry about things, got animated, got angry, got off their bums and marched with everybody else. And it's made us feel good, but it's also made us feel a little bit um, impotent and a little bit helpless and hopeless on occasions. So we've all marched in London, we were there, we were there marching against um, the massacre in Palestine. We were marching in 2002 when two million of us were marching in London, the anti-Iraq war campaign where we thought, you know, they've got to listen, they've got to listen to us, but that didn't, that didn't work. It's still, you know, there's millions of us get together. Last week, the 300,000 of us marching through London, anti-austerity. These things are fantastic things. They bring us all together and we feel energised, we feel part of a movement and part of a community. But sometimes it feels a bit too big for us. And also, if there's, if myself included, if we're too busy or life is too, too busy or we're too knackered, in my case, too knackered to go to London and march, then there are other ways that we can... We feel there's other ways that we can promote and, and display or show our political activism and commitment to a cause. So from these hundreds of thousands of people, we kind of bring it down to tiny little things, tiny, tiny little banners that we, um, that we create. This is part of the Craft of Collective campaign. So this isn't our pieces, this is from the collective. But we produce these tiny little, and they are little, little tiddly little things like we've got in our suitcase that we, 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 we think of a campaign and we work on a campaign that's going on nationally or locally and we produce little pieces of work that take a long time to make, obviously, that involve lots of thinking and planning and talking. We produce these things and then we put them in the community and we just leave them. Sometimes people nick them. Sometimes they stay there for ages and ages. But it doesn't actually matter what happens to them because they're not precious to us. That's the whole concept of craftivism, I suppose, in a nutshell that we're not about making things that we feel very precious about. So this, this piece is a, is a piece around London Fashion Week for last year, which, which um, kind of merged together the whole fact that a majority of people involved in the fashion production industry are on you know, less than, less than, less than minimum wage, you know, way beyond our minimum wage. Yet, of course, this multi-billion pound industry is perpetuated by us in that kind of exchange of, um, of purchasing from shops like Primark and H&M and Gap and things. So what would happen in this ex example is you might come across this little ba banner in, uh, in uh, where if this was on a fence somewhere in London, and you might think, what what that's about? What is that? What does that mean? And you might Google the craft of this collective and it will take you to the information about the fashion industry and about um, sweatshops and it'll, it will direct you to campaigns that you can potentially get involved with if you choose to. So it's a kind of mechanism for bringing people's ideas driving people to, to particular campaigns or ideas. Um, so, you know, we might get a bit um, fatigued by people shouting and broadcasting and proclaiming at us, these are the things we believe in and you must get involved in these things. And actually, people shouting actually turns us off, doesn't it, sometimes? So this kind of work is the opposite of that. It's very kind of quiet, slow, not-in-your-face kind of activism. And um, there's a few projects that we've, we've been involved, involved with um, locally and nationally. Um, we helped set up a project in, uh, in Glasgow. So I've got a, a friends, friends that live in Glasgow and they saw what we were doing. So they've set up a Glasgow craftivist. And between us, we've created a thousand paper cranes, haven't we? Uh, which was a long, tedious, boring process. It started off really exciting and we thought, Happy idea. This one. Whose idea was this? Um, we do, a thousand cranes is produced every year to coincide with Hiroshima Day, and there's a lovely story around a young girl called Sadako who produced, who started to make cranes prior, prior to the um, Hiroshima bombing. Prior to that, because in, Jap in Japanese uh, mythology, cranes give you health, wealth, and happiness. So she started making these cranes. She became unwell, 
um, and she died, and her friends continued to make the thousand. So it's a lovely kind of um, story that's kind of grown across, um, across the years. So every year for Hiroshima Day, 6th of August, people across the world make cranes, make a thousand cranes, and they send them off to Hiroshima. So on the, war, the um, Hiroshima Bomb Memorial is a pile, a mountain of paper cranes every year. So our cranes will eventually fly over to Hiroshima when we can organise how to raise money for the stamps. But, uh, so we've made 500 in Birmingham, 500 in Glasgow, and we're going to send them uh, en masse in August. And one of the things that we're quite passionate about as a group of people is just trying to get people to think about things, not necessarily influence people's thinking, tell them what to think, but just get them to, to think. You know, I, doesn't care, I don't, don't care what you vote, just bloody vote. That was our kind of message, wasn't it, really, um, the beginning of the year. We were so keen on making sure that people recognised that they had a voice, that they had the vote. So we uh, produced loads and loads of... Um, of uh, cross-stitched tiny little banners and we made some of these instant collages which I think are re have become really effective uh, for us to literally that's on a that's a you know bunch of stuff from the suitcase quick photo on the phone printed off on the computer and then laminated as a poster so we put these posters across um, across the city in various places and again you know somebody might ignore that or somebody might be it, it might trigger something with them and they might go off and register to vote so in the park and all over the place. Um, and there's lots of different campaigns that you can get involved with that don't, um, that don't take up too much time but also contribute to a national campaign. So at the moment, we're involved with a, with a campaign with Marks and Spencers um, because they don't pay their, they don't pay their um, workers the, the living wage. There's a massive national campaign now to get organisations, big money-making companies, to pay the living wage. Not the minimum wage, but the living wage which is £7.15, I think it is, minimum £6.85. So there's a massive campaign to get Marks and Spencers to do this. Um, and the Crafters Collective nationally has a project called the Don't Blow It campaign. And they sew messages onto hankies, which is why it's called the Don't Blow It campaign. Send messages, sign me uh, sew messages onto hankies and then send them to people that have got the decision-making the decision -making powers. So at the moment, there's 14 of us across the country, all with a different member of the uh, Marks and Spencer's e executive board, um, and we have to send a, a message to them, a personalised message to them, to get them to think about um, paying the minimum wage. Now, some people might think, oh, what a load of rubbish, why bother, what's the point? But if I wrote to him, this man called Lance Phillips, if I wrote to Lance Phillips and said, what are you doing about your mother? He might say, very nice, delete, or very, yeah, another email. But if I said it in this and it comes in the post and he thinks, someone's taken hours to make that. He might, he might actually read it and he might spend more time thinking about it and it might influence his decision. It might not do, but the chances are it might do as well. And I suppose what we're trying to do is get into and get into people's kind of creative psyche and appeal to people's kind of humanitarian human side to get them to kind of put the connection together with with people that believe passionately about things who invest time in sending a message and giving that precious message to, some, to somebody else um, oh sorry there's no children here is there i just wanted to say that we're not all it's not all about tweeness and i do put yeah sorry i should have checked i was expecting that one to come up so quickly it's not all about tweeness with us we're not about being uh vintage inspired middle class women that sit and drink drink tea and eat cakes and make lovely things it's not about that we are quite angry women aren't we we are quite angry. We've earned our place in the world as being angry women. We've been feminists for many, many years. You know, we grew up, grew up in feminist families, many of us. So it's important to us that we are, um, that message comes across on occasions in the right environment. So our bunting campaign is about, um, we're trying to challenge the notion that everything now is all about the vintage and it's about this kind of looking back um, to the 1950s when it was all lovely and everything was lovely and women knew that, you know, women made and men did. That was the kind of the concept and the cursory all sops of the world, if we're not careful, they're going to they're gonna infiltrate our world and turn us into modern housewives. We don't, we don't want to be like that. So we're trying to reappropriate re the images of the, uh, of the 1950s and turn them into something a bit more kind of confrontational. And sorry if anybody was offended by that. I was, I was supposed to put the star on, on the U and I didn't, didn't do that. Um, there's a little slideshow there of some stuff, and I'll maybe come back to that. But um, that's us. Oh, that's me. So um, I do various other things as well as the craftivism. 
and uh, you know, please feel free to contact me. But I would also say that craftivism, as I say, is not about me, um, me giving you this amazing new skill. It's not about that at all. It's about just a couple of people getting together and making stuff that maybe has a meaning that you might send somewhere to somebody else to have a think about what you've written about or any of those things. It's not about us saying we hold this very special, precious gift that we can, you know, if you're lucky, we'll bestow upon you. It's not about that. It's about anybody just getting together and creating stuff and using your, using your skills and your knowledge. Um, and just as a little kind of background, this is a project we did at the Library of Birmingham. Every year there's a, there's a campaign, 16 Days of Activism Against Violence Against Women and Children. So we produced 16 pieces of craftivism um, during three or four uh, Sunday afternoons. And of course, when you come together, and it's a bit like meeting the crafty mothers today, it's fantastic. When you come together and you, you start talking and you start making, making and relaxing, the conversation just flows so beautifully and you end up talking about things that you didn't, you didn't actually realise you thought had an opinion about or you hadn't really um, connected with anybody else about. So when we made these pieces collectively, we talked a lot about gender inequality. We also talked a lot about our families or just other stuff as well. Um, and it is just really about coming together, using the creativity as a tool to promote and discuss ideas, but also do something... Um, oh, sorry, another pair of boobs there as well. It gets worse, isn't it? It gets worse. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Maybe some more nipples. Um, OK, so that's, that's the end of, of, uh, of my presentation. But feel free to have a rummage through my case, if that isn't too ruder an invitation, have a rummage through and have a look at some of the stuff if you want to. There's a couple of brilliant books that I think have kind of inspired us, um, especially this one, very cheap, it's only a fiver, uh, The Little Book of Craftivism, which has got lots of great ideas in it that has kind of kick-started us really to get, to get, um, to get ourselves together. Um, but as I say, the best place to start is looking at the Craftivist Collective national website. And I'm happy to chat to people about their ideas and bring ideas together and do some joint projects if anybody's interested as well. So thank you very much. Cheers. It is as part of the, yeah, yeah, I think yarn bombing came before craftivism, didn't it? So do people know what yarn bombing is? Everybody know. Do you want to explain what yarn bombing is to um, us? I live in a place called Hornby, which is north of Liverpool, on the coast, and just around the corner um, is where places like um, Steve Jarn and Solomon are from. Although I'm from Bloomington. connected you made the connect yeah exactly so yarn bombing and guerrilla knitting and all those sorts of things that are um again new words for things that people have been doing for donkey's years using creativity to bring things together um there's a really good example of cnd cnd women of making the three mile long scarf the pink scarf that everybody had heard about that where it took them years and years and years to do and across groups across the country literally made a, a scarf that's three miles long and they wrapped it twice around the ministry of defense um, so that's a fantastic example of, of, um, of yarn bombing and guerrilla knitting. But things like using creativity just to enhance a space is a lovely thing. And that happens all over the place. You can do fence weaving as well, where you can you know, weave a little word, a little tiny word into a fence that somebody might stumble across if they're, if they're noticing things or, or, or it might just get ignored. But that's our next project, actually, isn't it? Our bit of fence weaving in a local park. Oh, great, secret knitter. <coughs>
for the Banksy of knitting. Oh, was it? Great. Yeah. But they knitted the jumper, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. And now they corporately do that. It's they do. Thing. Yeah, but exactly, exactly, yeah. Okay. Any other, any other questions, comments, reflections? Yeah. And how, how big is your fridge? And, and would you say there was a maximum number? Oh, that's a good question. So how big is it? Okay, yeah. Well, um, we there's probably about... 15 of us, isn't there, that get together on a monthly basis, then we do different kind of themes, different kind of projects or different um, campaigns. But then, aside from that, um, I know other groups of people that are just two or three people that get together and do stuff. Or, but you can do it you know, on your own as well, can't you? But I would probably say that a good number of people, maybe about four or five, because we've kind of grown to really um, trust each other and, and spend time with each other as a group of friends now, haven't we, really? And we are a bit, we were just saying this earlier, we're a little bit kind of precious about it now. We don't want anybody else coming in, which is terrible. <laughs> but, you know, the whole kind of anti-feeling anti, uh, anti -feeling of craftivism. But when you get to spend time with each other and make stuff together, you, you know, you want it, you, keep, you need to keep it small and precious. Because if you don't, then it becomes yeah, yeah, yeah. a different thing entirely. That's why we haven't got any money behind it. I don't want to be a funded project, and I don't want to you know, aspire to give up my job, because I quite like my job. So it's about, keep, for us, it's about keeping it small, keeping it precious, because actually, in the world of, um, sound like an old front lab, but in the world of kind of social media where, it, you know, everything is instant and takes a split second to make and create and stick up, we're the opposite of that. We're kind of, we're a bit like Luddites, we're kind of, you know, slow, trying to slow it down as much as possible. And actually, by making such slow... Um, methodological ways of creating messages, it, has, it does have actually a, a quite a powerful message. And then you, you're still posting stuff? Or yeah, yeah, we post it, so we use it as we use a lot of the stuff as imagery for then bigger campaigns or directing people to a campaign, like for example the one about the sweatshops. So we might use that image to direct people to the, like the change.org um, petition about sweatshops. We're doing something at the moment, we're trying to do something at the moment about John Lewis, because John Lewis is opening in September. And there was a massive campaign in London um, about John Lewis, uh, because it has an outsource, sorry, I'm using up my minutes now, but it uses outsource cleaners. And the outsource cleaning company only, pays them, only paid the minimum wage in London to its cleaners. There was a massive inquiry, and the inquiry was called, I feel like a rat in a palace, because one of the cleaners said, I'm on such a low wage, when I come into work, I feel like a rat in a palace. Which breaks your heart, really. So there was a massive campaign, and then... Uh, for John Lewis to pay the living wage for London, which he now does, has, does do. And we need to know whether they're going to do that in Birmingham as well, because it's all about, you know, the partners in John Lewis, everyone's equal, everyone gets a share of the profits. If you're outsourced or you're a part-time worker or a contractor worker, you don't get that. So we want to do a campaign with Citizens UK in Birmingham about getting John Lewis to pay the living wage for its outsourcing companies or, or influence the companies to pay that. Because, you know, you can't make billions of pounds based on this notion of being a collective and everyone's equal, when in fact, quite clearly, people aren't equal if they clean your shop. Thank you very much. All right, OK. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, we, we try to keep a really good balance between the big stuff and the little stuff. So we were talking about doing a campaign around Mosley Baths, because a lot of us use Mosley Baths. Um, what else have we done that's local? Um, stuff around the Asda. In King's Heath, there's a big thing about Asda unloading in the middle of the night. And masses of noise and inconvenience for local people. So we've done some stuff with Asda. We sent some hankies to Asda. Um, so we do do it, yeah, local, local stuff is, is, and this is this kind of hyper-locality stuff, I suppose, isn't it, about bringing it right down to kind of what goes on in your postcode as well as what goes on in the rest of the world.
Oh, yes, yes. Get my T-shirt out. Okay. Yeah, that's a brilliant question. So, so in my suitcase is our little tiddly T-shirts that we made um, as part of the national campaign to get... Do you remember the, the fire in Bangladesh, Rana Plaza fire, where it was a five-storey building and it collapsed and huge fire and hundreds of people died? And companies like Primark, Gap, H&M... Tesco's all had investments in those companies. So it was a massive campaign to get them to give compensation to the survivors and the, and the victims' families of the, of the um, fire. So we all, across the, across the country, craftivists made little tiddly T-shirts, and there was a mass tweeting on a particular day. Mass, mass tweeting. And there were thousands and thousands of people that sent this information, as well as just their own non-craftivists sending messages as well. Um, and influenced um, the the um, it influenced H and M and Primark. So we got we got uh, tweets back from the CEO of Primark, who'd obviously prepared a, a message expecting all this m mass bombardment of information. But it happened. You know, so, so from our you know from our little cafe in King's Heath that we meet in on a Thursday night when we made a couple of felt T-shirts, all the way up to the CEO of Primark, it kind of went and it came back again. So it does work. It does work. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.